now. Okay, now, here we are. And again, uh, we're gonna we're gonna now pretend like we have not been talking for the last couple of minutes. But um, welcome, and we're so glad to have you here for First Tuesday. And for everybody who has joined in, we're glad that you're here with us to hear from Ann Adams from Crush the Pain. Um, you are brave souls to come on and listen uh, to us discuss pain. But I also have a feeling that this is a very relevant topic for a lot of people uh, who have to manage this. So. Um, uh, one or two housekeeping things just real quickly. Um, we'll, we'll have a conversation until about 12.30, 12.40, and then I certainly wanna be able to open it up to anyone that's on and listening who may have questions or would just like to offer your encouragement or support for the work that Ann's doing. Uh, we certainly wanna give you the opportunity for that. Um, if this is your first time to be part of a first Tuesday conversation, these are um, conversations that we have the first Tuesday, quite clever, of the month, each month, and it's with someone in the mindfulness community, prison community, um, some some overlap of those two things. And um, a month or two ago, and we, we somehow connected, and I, I honestly don't know where that connection first started, but we connected, and you wrote a wonderful blog for us um, about compassion um, for our, our website. And so uh, from there, we've just sort of moved forward, and, um, and so we're excited to have you on today. Um, so, without further ado, um, Anne, if you would like to just give us a general introduction to who you are, uh, we'll, we'll get into your work here momentarily, but as a human being, who are you and what can we know about you? Mm. Well, that's a big question that nobody usually asks, right? Oh, do you hear, do you still hear me? Because you're suddenly off my screen. Yes, yes, I hear you. Okay, so I don't see you anymore, but I'm going to just assume that you see me now unless this comes back on. Okay, um, yeah, we're, we're seeing you loud and clear. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, so I think I'll talk about who I am as a person in relationship to how I came became interested in studying pain. I think I've always been interested in helping other people soothe their pain and more emotionally initially soothe their pain feel more compassionate um have have that feeling that somebody cares about them and they're not alone and so i would do so much to learn how do i help these people i worked with um youth that had run away i worked with homeless people i work i now work with uh, veterans that have addictions um i worked uh, with people at the end of life what what I didn't realize until uh, probably 10 years ago was that all this work was really coming from my desire to ease my own pain. Oh, wow. um, be because I thought that there was, um, let me try, I gotta try to find you here. I can't find you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm talking blindly here. Uh, so I, I just knew that, uh, so I finally realized that I was trying to heal my own pain. Um, but I didn't give myself permission to do that because I think at some level, I didn't feel like I deserved it because um, my suffering wasn't enough or it was different or other people suffered more or I just didn't deserve it for whatever reason. So um, that's a little bit about who I am and how I came to look at pain kind of from the outside and then finally from the inside. Yeah, and man. So that's, that's something that we could spend a whole lifetime trying to figure out is how we, how we play that game where we, we have a, a spectrum where some are worthy, some aren't. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not in any way going to try to do this, but one of our favorite comedians in our family is a guy named Brian Regan. And he has a whole bit about going to the hospital and they ask you to rate your pain and you know, a scale from one to 10. And he said, you, you don't wanna go too low because then they're just gonna put you at the back of the list, but you don't wanna go too high because you're not gonna, you don't wanna offend everybody who is actually in pain. So what's the, you know, what's the right number that you're supposed to say? Um, but I, I, I had never 
I guess, consciously thought of that, but uh, we certainly do that on a subconscious level for sure, where we sort of rate our pain in comparison to others. Um, and so what, what sort of process have you done with yourself to get to a place where you, you feel like you have permission to work on your own pain or, or are you there yet? Sometimes I am, but a lot of times, no, I, I think that my healing has still come about a lot through let me be there for others. So that that's been my career path. Uh, again, working in hospice in different areas. And once in a while, I'll let it peek through. And the, I think when I was most able to touch with that was at a, a really uh, difficult time in my life when I was going through my second divorce, a second failed marriage, feeling really down. I was also working with uh, people that had addictions and I discovered uh, mindfulness and I would study so hard and learn and practice um, to help these people I, I was working with deal with their pain and suffering. Um, and then I, I finally realized I had this aha moment like, and you need this and you can do and you're okay to work on yourself. And so I think that's why uh, mindfulness really became um, what I value the most and, and where I come from. Although there's so many other pieces to managing and working with pain, uh, but that's kind of at the heart for me of all this. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. And, and to me, that's one of the, a, another difficult place to get to when it comes to mindfulness. Um, I come from a, a very conservative, almost fundamentalist Christian background. And in that background, you're not supposed to think about yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's in fact borderline sinful uh, to put your needs anywhere near the needs of others. Um, but, but it's actually quite the opposite, that, that whatever is inside of us is what flows out to other people. And the more work we do, if we begin with ourselves and do the work there, then it, mm -hmm. it, it begins to overflow and benefit others. But it's, it, it's a weird jump to have to get over uh, to, to break over that, that barrier that tells us don't care about yourself, only care about other people. And yeah, it really is. Right. And you, we tell people this all the time, that old thing, put on your own oxygen mask first, right. but it, it's really hard for us to actually do it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and it's not selfish, like, as you were saying, it's not selfish because if you're not fulfilling and taking care of yourself, you can't be there for others. But to, to really um, embody that um, is a practice, lifelong practice, I think, for so many people out there. Yeah, yes, for sure. What does, just uh, generally speaking, and again, we uh, will get into specifically how it relates to pain, but what does, what does mindfulness practice look like for you? Yeah, so mindfulness practice i think so with as i'm talking about pain and the acronym that i came up with crush crush the pain there's a lot of words that are in there that we use compassion mindfulness that have that have been thrown around a lot and in that you know, where it's more and more um, common in our society to hear this, be compassionate, be mindful. But yeah, we have to ask when you're talking to somebody else, what does that mean to you? Because some of that depth of what do, what does mindfulness mean can be lost. So thanks for thanks for asking. Um, so mindfulness for me, when I'm talking about mindfulness, I talk about um, really based on John Cabot Zen's work where he says, and I will read it, paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So now to unpack that one sentence, again, we could be here for days, um, but some of the things that are most important to me for myself in working um, with now the veterans that I work with, um, 
on purpose. So there's, there's that intentional practice, or we say formal practice of really being diligent and have a day, having a daily conscience practice. And then there's that being mindfulness in the world. So really distinguishing those two um, and encouraging some formal practice and the formal practice can be little bits and pieces. So actually, so let's go back to what do we mean by pain? So another Mm. word that we need to define, right? So pain, um, if you look at the formal definition by the International Association for the Study of Pain, part of the definition is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. Now they relate it to um, potential tissue damage or not. So a lot of times when we're talking about pain, we're talking about that physical thing. But the pain really then, if you look at that, it's trauma. Um, and you can look at, you know, sometimes we talk about big T trauma, major trauma, or little T's, like just a lot of little uh, dings, right? And that's where I think it comes in sometimes. Some people have had a lot of those little traumas throughout the life that they need healing, but you know, it it wasn't enough that I didn't really have any trauma. So anyway, pain, I'm looking at it kind of as trauma, trauma, a lot of where that stems from is this feeling of I'm not safe. And another way to look at pain, right, is your body, your mind, your brain, some combination of the two is telling you that you are not safe, beware, you're not safe. So all of us, I know the people that I work with, and I must, you tell me, Corey, I would just assume everyone um, in the population that you're working with, there's some trauma that they've experienced, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we're all trying to healing, heal this trauma to heal this trauma. We need to feel safe. So, so working on those two. So then, so now back to meditation, what do I mean? So sometimes when in here, it's like an unsafe neighborhood, right? I can't remember who said that, but it's this unsafe neighborhood. You don't want to go there for too long by yourself. Yes. So being gentle I've mindful. never heard that. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. I've never heard that before. But yes, that's such a great, it's an unsafe neighborhood where you don't want to be, but it's your own mind. And oh, yes, yes. So oh. I can't think somebody out there probably knows. And I wish I can see you. I'm staring at a blank screen. Um, and Annie, somebody said that my mind is like an unsafe neighborhood. You really don't want to go there alone. So when we're asking people that have been traumatized to sit mindfully, that's a big ask. That's that can be really painful and really, really hard. And then on the other hand, we've made it seem like this mushy, like soft practice, but it's not, it's really intense. So mindfully sitting and then in a certain way. And that way is the way of kindness and curiosity, gentleness, beginner's mind. And again, when we're working with someone that has had a lot of trauma, asking them to be kind to themselves, to be gentle, uh, to be compassionate is a hard ask because it's probably hasn't been a safe place for them to be, um, have their guard up. So yeah, so on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally, and then that non-judgment is really hard to and again a lifelong practice so when when I'm talking about being mindful I'm talking about all of that and it and it goes hand in hand with compassion and I think Corey that's how we got in touch in a weird way through um, social media so there are some benefits to social media uh, and there's some really good stuff out there yeah yeah so working gently um, with tapping into what's going on inside you and, and being safe. So that's how kind of I look at the mindfulness practice. Yeah, that's the, the, the idea of needing to be safe um, with, with both elements of, of mindfulness and also with pain. Um, that, that just strikes me as such a great umbrella to put both of those under because 
it, it, it's such a vulnerable feeling sometimes to go inward. Um, but then I also just think about my own kids, uh, you know, whenever they fall down and scrape their knee or, or, you know, something happens and they get hurt. Um, it's, it's the panic that, Mm -hmm. that intensifies everything and the sense that something has happened and now I'm not safe. And I've, I've never put it in that context before of, of addressing their felt safety rather than their physical feelings. Um, and it's, you know, it's the old, whenever your, your toddler falls down and they look right at the parent, you know, or, or the nearest adult to see what their reaction is going to be, because if the reaction is panic, then mm-hmm. the toddler panics. Um, but that's just so insightful, I think, to, to frame it as it's not so much that they, they maybe feel pain as much as feel unsafe in that moment through the experience of pain. Um, yeah. And that, I never put that, that, uns- those two things together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, that unsafe, that unsafeness intensifies that. Hey, that then your alarm of pain goes off. Listen to me, listen to me. You're not safe. So if you were raised as a child that, didn't have uh, people around to help help you feel safe. Now you've got to build that from the inside and you have to be uh, your own safety net. And that's, again, if you don't feel worthy um, or even if you do, it's a, it's a hard practice to be your own advocate for pain and safety. Right. Right. And, uh, and, and in the same way that you were talking earlier about um, feeling like you have permission to address your own pain, um, that that's something that we've encountered, especially in the prison system. And even recently in working with law enforcement personnel is this sense that it, it's the, they, they actually uh, have a, a very similar approach in that they both feel like they have to be, I think what they would consider diligent but what we would call um, mm-hmm. uh, reactive and uh, almost almost having a trauma response to the environment around them. Because in both settings, whether they are somebody who is in prison or a, a guard or maybe someone in law enforcement, they both feel the same uh, feeling of, if I let my guard down, bad things will happen to me. And so yeah. anything that goes into that, that vulnerability or anything that requires me to be soft and gentle with myself first is big thumbs down. Um, and so yeah. it, it does, it takes a lot of time and work to get to a place where people go, okay, I can see how this might actually be a good thing. Yeah. And that's where your compassion work comes in. Right. And, yeah. and I think, part of that article and what I was trying to say and and what you're saying is in true compassion, there's a lot of strength. So there's that softness to be open to yourself and, and be with the pain of others that takes a lot in itself. And then to have those boundaries, um, knowing that being there for the other doesn't mean it all me letting go of my safety or my boundaries. And um, Brene Brown says it so well. There's a, she says that the people that she studied most with the, that are most compassionate also have the best boundaries. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And and it's hard. And, and, And it's, powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so when it when it comes to actual dealing with pain, you, you've worked with folks in hospice, you said now you're working with veterans, um, and, and people who experience a, a lot of physical pain, what is your approach to helping them in the moment they are in this state of, of agony? Um, what, what, what do you do in that moment with them? Yeah, so, um, interesting when I started studying this I was kind of on the outside of looking in to see what others were doing and and I am lucky enough to work in this certain healthcare system where there are a lot of a lot of options and a lot of specialties 
Um, so that's really good. And the downside to that is a lot of the patient care just in general. Um, and then when it comes around to pain becomes what we call siloed or um, these guys, these specialties are doing this and these specialties are doing this and, and they're not talking. So um, I was seeing that we would send people to different specialties and they would come back and I, I would say as the nurse, uh, so what did you learn? And they said, uh, I learned there's nothing that they can do about my pain mm. or, or they went for an x-ray or an MRI and, and what they learned from the results of that was just normal wear and tear showing up on somebody's spine x-ray. What, what they would learn because of what they heard is my back's messed up. Yeah. So this explains why I need to stay in this pain forever. So, so this is what I was observing, like this, this silo of care. And so now what I'm, trying to do is bringing all that together in this holistic comprehensive way so what did you hear how can we reframe that can you sit with me with your pain and tell me what's going on under that um, really looking at the root the root cause of the pain and oftentimes under there there's a original injury that goes along with so much more emotional stuff right yeah. um, that feeling of not having this perfect fit body you are able to be injured you are vulnerable maybe you got injured ultimately doing something that you don't um, really agree with anymore so so one start by really looking at what's going on under there tapping into your body and what do you feel watching the pain uh, sometimes when people are in chronic pain or persistent pain there's this um, thought that it's solid and hard and fixed and if I say on a scale of zero to ten what's your pain they'll say Eight. You know, every day I know what they're going to say. So really sitting and looking at with that, you see that the pain comes and goes, gets bigger and smaller, hotter and cooler. And noticing that, that it can be formed and moved and changed. And then also noticing we can concentrate down on the pain. Um, I'm looking for my little model, but I don't see it. We could concentrate down on the pain and be curious and kind and interested in that. But now let's also expand and know that there's the pain, but there's also some pleasant sensations, some pleasant, uh, maybe your left big toe feels okay. Wow. Maybe yeah. your right ear is you know, so looking at all that. So we'll play, we'll play with the pain a little bit is a big piece of what I'll do. And then helping interpret some of the uh, stories that they've told themselves around the pain too. Yeah. Wow. That's, and that's some heavy lifting. Um, and, and especially in the moment, I, my, my mind goes to, um, the, the place that I meditate primarily is here in my office, just right here in this corner beside me, there's a, a little cushion and a couple of, of pillows that I, I kneel down on. Um, and I mm -hmm. will inevitably at some point get a foot cramp. It happens every time. And, yes. and that the, the foot cramp for me, there is no story I can tell myself to get out of the, the pain of it. But lately though, uh, and actually even in preparing for our conversation today, I've thought, what what is this? You know, where, why, why is this happening? Why is it the same place, almost the same time? Um, and, and so what, what do I, what would happen if I just sit and let it go? Um, and it, it does, it spikes, it kind of intensifies, but then after a little while it starts to drop off. Um, and, but, but the, the sheer intensity of it though, um, is something that I, I feel like if someone were to ask me to, to talk through it or to walk through it, um, would be so, so difficult to do because of the intensity of it. Um, and so my, the question I'm finally getting to is um, what, what, what kind of response do people tend to give you whenever you're, you're doing this with them? Um, like, are, are people receptive? Are people like, shut up and leave me alone? Like, just let me, let me get through this. Like, what, what, what tends to be kind of a typical response to that? Yeah, well, 
luckily the people that come visit me are pretty receptive, but that's, that's a whole, that's huge what you just said. So what you're saying is that you work with the pain in a really skillful way. So having that mindfulness and that skill is huge. And so what we'll talk about is there's this balance between being diligent, and I think you use that term, um, and being self-compassionate and kind. Mm -hmm. And again, remember, sometimes the self-compassionate thing is to be diligent and finding that balance. So when you're sitting and you're having this cramp, what is the most skillful thing to do? Is it to watch it and observe as it rises and falls and gets more intense and, and less intense and learn from there? is the most skillful practice in that moment to um, get up and move yeah. and shake it out. And again, that's just really fine tuning. So I think when I talk to them about it in that way, and we'll always talk about sitting, sitting in meditation is not about uh, being really relaxed, typically, sometimes that happens. And that's great. But sometimes it's about being able to be with that pain, emotional or physical. Sometimes the most skillful thing to do when you're feeling a lot of pain is to use distractions. And we and um, the people I work with have have learned a lot of techniques for distraction. Um, going for a walk, you know, shaking it off, holding ice, different things like that, um, and finding the balance. And as you're more and more mindful, the more and more you can, you can sit with that and be okay with that and ride the waves of that and not get thrown off, but always know, knowing that there's a time when the most skillful thing is to get up and shake that cramp out. So, um, but I was talking to a gentleman just the other day, kind of want to share this because it talks about actual healing and chronic pain uh, and how people react to uh, to this message. And so in healing, and I'd like to hear your thoughts or definition on healing, but we often talk about in chronic pain or other issues that it's not necessarily about curing. It's about being able to be with what is, with what's going on in a creative way and being able to also find the joy and having this whole complete life that this piece, this chronic pain, this trauma is a piece of. Yes. It's like that chronic pain or trauma. Someone told me this a long time ago and it so helped me. She's like, this is the landscape of your life. And what had happened is like this hole in the landscape. And a lot of times we want to fill up that hole and pat that down and think that'll be the end, but you can't, you can't fill up that hole, but you can plant flowers around it. You make a little uh, lake in it, whatever you're going to do with that hole. But that's that's part of you. So, so I was talking to a gentleman the other day and he has this ringing in his ears that a, a lot of vets, if they've been in, in combat um, and had head injuries or have been around loud explosions, <clears throat> they'll get this ringing in their ears called tinnitus or tinnitus. And he had a lot of injuries, a, a lot of physical things, uh, going on but this particular day he was sitting with this ringing in his ears and said I just want you to help me or come to this class because I want to get rid of this ringing in your ear in the ears and, and I said um yeah so that's probably not going to happen and he, you know his face like what do you mean what am I here for but so then that that conversation opens up that conversation of healing without curing. And can we go beyond this and have that pain or that ringing in the ears or that foot cramp not be everything? We're not seeing life from just that. Yeah. So uh, did I answer your question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and and I, I love that you bring up the idea of healing. Um, I, we actually, my wife and I just had a conversation with some good friends uh, this past Sunday night. We were over at their house just hanging out talking. And um, the the wife of this couple that we were with, she had a stroke several years ago. And, and she's young. She's in her, uh, I believe, late 30s right now. And 
Um, and so she had a stroke and, and is still living with the effects of that, uh, trying to manage it, uh, doing therapy with it, that sort of thing. And she mentioned how um, other people that she knows who have had strokes um, have shared with her that, especially in, and I, I, I sound like I'm picking on uh, the Christian tradition today, and I, I promise you that I'm not, but uh, <laughs> especially in the Christian tradition, it's very common for this particular woman to uh, be at, a, at an event and have someone come up to her and say, I feel like I need to pray for your healing. And she's been living with this stroke now for a decade or so. And to her, healing is more about, yeah, I would really like to get rid of my anxiety, or I would really like to get rid of this, you know, compulsion I have to eat chocolate at 10 o'clock at night or, or whatever it is, because she has begun to see herself as multidimensional. She is not a person who had a stroke. Um, a, a stroke is one dimension of her identity and one that she has not just come to terms with, but it, it, it has been incorporated into who she is. And so uh, we, we had a really good conversation the other night about what it means to be healed. And, and at mm -hmm. what point does it, does it go beyond just curing? And, and healing is, is more, of a, more of reaching that place of acceptance that can be so difficult to do. Um, right. but, but seeing it, it as, um, I love what um, a guy out in California, uh, Father Gregory Boyle, who works with uh, former gang members, um, he talks about their scars and their wounds that uh, they, they reach a point where their scars have become their friends and their scars mm -hmm. are the things that have given them their, their strength and their identity. Um, and so when we reach that place, we don't feel like we're this broken person in need of healing uh, because it, it becomes part of our identity. Um, and so I'm, I'm so glad you, you mentioned that because I, I think that's probably also something else that we carry with us in terms of of either pain or of discomfort or something that we uh, that we feel like we have to deal with or manage, um, that we we can become very one dimensional. And I am right. just this person with this disease or this person with this diagnosis, rather than seeing ourselves as multi dimensional. Um, right, right. In and that being said, which is absolutely true, um, sometimes. And, and part of that work is asking yourself, who would I be without this pain, right? And there's so, so much more. Um, and also then part of the process is <clears throat> making sure, I just feel like it's important to say, making sure that you've worked within the healthcare system uh, to see, is there something underneath? So as I'm healing, as I'm becoming this whole creative um, person that can feel joy and gratitude, um, what, what else is going on under there and working with other providers or specialists or uh, whatever that is, to also, you make sure you've done all you can for that cure piece. So, so definitely that balance, because sometimes um, when, when people hear about this healing and it's your mind, you know, uh, it's your mind-body connection, uh, instead of going from body-mind, it's your mind-body connection. The message they'll get is just live with it. Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, so definitely finding the balance and always exploring what else is going on underneath and what can I do to, to feel less pain? Is there something that can be cured along this way and healing in the process? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's so good. Um, talk to us about the acronym CRUSH. What, what does that, uh, what, what do those words stand for? Where did it come from? What is it? Yeah, thanks. So it came from me being really frustrated with our healthcare system and um, watching people in pain um, not really being addressed at a deep level. There's a lot of things being thrown at it, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, nobody is intentionally doing anything wrong. It's just a big, deep issue. Yeah. Um, so that not being addressed at a deep level and then also um, is something that you would probably have a lot to talk to about is that 
people were being um, thrown in jail, right? Thrown in prison um, for trying to deal with pain at whatever level they could. Yeah. Uh, so the people that I would see would be people that the only thing that was given to them for pain management was opioids. Mm -hmm. And that he that treatment went awry. And now they're being treated as an addict, or now we're trying to work on their addictions. And, you know, I'm blaming them for that. So this whole like, how can we look at this and teach people uh, everything, every aspect of it. So briefly, um, it stands for compassionately. And again, we can talk for hours on that. Um, the C is compassionately relate to. So the relating is learning about mindfulness, relating to your, to your pain and understanding it, recognizing where that's coming from. Uh, and then the U is the understanding it and just learning really about the basic theories of pain because the understanding um, can be empowering also. Yeah. Um, and then seeking support is the S mm -hmm. and the he and the H is the heal, which we've already talked a little bit about. So the seeking support is interesting one too, right? Because if you've come from a place of trauma um, a place where you're feeling unsafe, oftentimes with that, it's not safe to ask for support. Wow. So, so all these come, you know, they come together. So you got to touch a little bit on a self-compassion practice, which is really hard when you come from a place of trauma and don't feel like you deserve it. Meditation can help that. Meditation can help self-compassion. Ah. So, and then practicing seeking support from a community um, that understands where you're coming from is, and is also not stuck in mm -hmm. that identity, wow. <clears throat> right? Um, and that came up a little bit today or, or yesterday, I guess, Corey, when um, I told you, like, I, I feel nervous to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And you said, oh, it's okay. Um, but that really, that's a huge thing for people to say, I feel vulnerable. Yeah. Because a lot of times you weren't, that wouldn't be okay to feel vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes I think, oh, if I tell Corey, I don't feel safe, mm -hmm. I'm feeling this kind of emotional pain of being out there and vulnerable, you know, Corey may say, well, you're, you're not whole, you're not good, you're not worth it. Right. We don't want to get you to come talk, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. seeking support is a huge thing that takes practice also. And um, so then with um, that acronym and, and the website, I wanted places for support for people that, um, that could go that were mostly, I think most of the things are free on there, like things you can do, um, organizations you can reach out to, to get support, um, ways to support yourself, um, organizations where, where you'll find support. Um, and then just really quickly, there's a whole section about kind of the basics of support for chronic pain. Um, Anti-inflammatory diets can help decrease the chronic pain um, as it relates to inflammation. Sleep is important. Ex exercise, that's a huge subject with, the, with chronic pain. Um, gratitude. Um, so all those practices. So yeah, thanks for asking. That's a, a little synopsis of what crush means. Well, I... <laughs> I, I'm so glad you brought up all of those, uh, and I'm trying to I'm trying to like hone in on on a couple. But the uh, the vulnerability thing is so good uh, because I think like like you said, like I I, I tried to just say uh, you know no reason to be nervous, uh, everything will be fine, um, which is easy for me to say because I I do this a lot. So, um, but we 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 kind of just naturally want to be dismissive of people's vulnerability of people's pain of people's concerns because in our mind it's helping them that if i mm -hmm. 
if I just dismiss, if I, if I downplay, if I say, well, you know, everybody gets that or, oh yeah, that's common. Or um, then I'm in my mind, I'm, I'm just helping to say, yeah, this is fine. When in reality, this might be really consuming someone's entire mind, entire emotional state. Um, and so then to dismiss or downplay sends that signal, I'm not safe to talk about it here with this person, even though okay. they probably don't feel that way, but they have now just communicated what you're feeling is not a big deal to me. Um, and, and man, that's such a good, just such a good mindful word for all of us, I think, to, uh, to receive people's vulnerability and expressions of, of, of that pain, whether it's physical, emotional, uh, felt safety, non-felt safety. Um, yeah. Oh man, that's, that's so good. Um, and yeah. the, the other part that just really, uh, kind of slapped me in the face is the idea of being part of a community that isn't stuck there, which is so difficult because that is the definition of that community. <laughs> so, so it, if you could just in maybe a minute or two, um, how do you know when it's time to be done with that community? Like, how do you know when, when that community has served its purpose and it's healthy now for you to actually move on and say, guys, you, you have been such a gift to me, but now it's time for me to no longer be part of this. How do you know when it's time to do that? Oh well, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I know the answer to that, but what would first, first come to me is, um, asking yourself that question, what would I be without my pain? Um, or how much are you starting to identify with that um, as a reason for not living fully? Mm. Um, and also maybe, I don't know, Corey, but maybe you don't ever need to be done, but where are you going to put that in your life? Yeah. Um, for example, I think the first thing that came up to me, so um, Believe it or not, as as a nurse, <laughs> um, uh, sometimes we get frustrated. We have to vent. So <laughs> I will um, go, you know, go behind the doors and rant and rave about somebody, and then, but you know, find find my grounding and find my compassion, find my peace, and and go on out there. And I think there's always kind of a place for that to go where I am just in pain. I don't feel like being um, virtuous or, you know, all knowing or right now. And I just want to uh, get down in there. And then that, and that helps me to, to move on. So if you're using uh, that community and that's, um, you know, kind of, I don't want to be dismissive at all, but I mean, that's a piece of being able to go where people really understand what you're feeling right now and meeting you where you're at. And, and then you can move on from there and, and come back, you know, it's just, it's a circle. It's, it's yeah. not a straight path. Um, did yeah. that, did that make sense? Kind of? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it makes me think of, we recently had a conversation with a group of guys that are in a re-entry program here in Little Rock. And um, the, the two programs that come into their facility are our program three days a week for mindfulness and meditation. And then a, an AA group that comes in to help with addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the two things that they're getting. And um, so we were just talking about something that had taken place in one of the AA meetings a day or two before, and uh, a couple of guys were talking about how helpful it was for them to, to kind of process through a couple of things. And one guy raised his hand and he said, man, I hate those meetings. And uh, you could kind of feel this like, I don't, I don't think you're allowed to say you hate AA meetings. Like that's, that's like the sacred thing. You can't, you can't talk <laughs> it. But he essentially made that point that, um, he said it, it feels like everybody that's in there is using it as a crutch. And of course he was, he was venting a little bit and, you know, was just kind of frustrated by it, but, um, and, and finally came around and said, yes, it helped me a little bit for a while, but now I just don't feel like I need it anymore. And, and so we talked about how sometimes that's a healthy thing to say, maybe, maybe not in a way that disparages something that other people are benefiting from, like, right. let, let it be good for the people who need it. But, um, it, it led to a really, um, I, I think, productive and insightful conversation with the guys about the benefits of using things for their purpose 
and, and understanding uh, what they're there for, how they help. Uh, but then also recognizing everything isn't for everybody. And we, we try to be open with that with mindfulness and meditation, um, that maybe meditation isn't for you. Maybe you've tried it and it just, it doesn't work. And, and it's this weird hokey thing, but there's something else that does. So find the thing that does, but. Well, I'm so glad you brought that, brought up that example, um, and 12 step programs in AA and this person that was able to say, I love when somebody's in my group and is able to say, that's a bunch of crap, yes. you know, or I feel yes. it's so wonderful for somebody to feel safe enough to express what truly is going on. And that's where a lot of the deep conversations come. Right. So, so one, that's huge. And two, it, part of, um, AA that I always, that I have this discussion with, I have a coworker that's um, very AA and I'm very mindfulness and they can definitely go together and we can have other conversations about that. But in AA there's um, identifying as an addict, uh, hi, I'm Ann and I'm an addict. Um, and then in mindfulness or what we talk about a lot and, and you said too with your um, friend that has had a stroke is I'm Ann and I have an addiction, or I'm in recovery. Sometimes that this terminology works really well, and sometimes this terminology works really well, and they're both okay. This I am an addict may work really well for people um, to keep it on the forefront mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I need to work on this for the rest of my life, as we do with chronic pain, as we do for anxiety or depression, whatever that is. And then this terminology, I have this, uh, helps us to realize that we are so much more. Yes. And you may go back and forth between the two and one verbiage may not work for you at all. And yeah. that's okay. Yes. Yes. And that was, uh, one of the, one of the elements of that conversation was, uh, yeah. I, I, I confessed that it has bothered me for a while. Just the terminology of, uh, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Um, I said, it, it might be helpful for you to reframe that as the first step is acknowledging that I have a behavior in response to something I've experienced or in response to right. something I'm trying to escape. Um, right. so I have this behavior and, um, and you can see light bulbs go off for a few people, but others very much resonate mm -hmm. with, I have a problem. And that, that has been helpful and meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so it, it, it is uh, going all the way back to uh, the beginning of the conversation that you were saying, just helping people reframe um, mm -hmm. the source of what they're dealing with, uh, be it physical pain, addiction, uh, emotional yeah. pain, but, but just yeah. that, that, little little tweak of language can can open up entirely new worlds for us to approach it yeah and corey knowing that that behavior that you're that is now you may call a problem that that behavior probably was what saved you at some point wow. that's what helped you deal with life mm. you know so so not to get angry at that it, it saved you and now as my Angelou would say, right? You know more, so you can do different and there'll be more skillful ways to react to whatever situation comes up. But honor that that behavior probably at somehow, some way, at some point in your life saved you. Man, oh, that's, that's again, I, I've never put that, uh, that together, but yes, you're exactly right. Because that's the, uh, that's how a lot of people have avoided breakdowns or how they dealt with the the trauma that was being inflicted on them uh, that they yes. didn't know how else to deal with it and this allowed them to deal with it and to to survive the moment and so oh my goodness that is so good yeah. uh well, well and you and i have have hogged the entire conversation here um i show that we've got eight minutes left uh we do have a few people on here with us live we we record these and and so it goes out to lots of folks after the fact but uh, i'm just curious if anyone that's on here with us live now if you have any uh comments or questions or anything that you would uh like to say while we have a few minutes left I have a question. My name's Carmen. You mentioned a website with resources. What is that website? 
Yeah, so it's a website that um, I just try, you know, I'm just plugging along, trying to put stuff up there that helps. It's called Crush the Pain. So crushthepain.com. Um, and yeah, if you go look at it and comment and just let me know what more needs to be up there, what was helpful, that wasn't helpful, um, that'd be great. Yeah. And I've put it there in the chat for everyone. I, I think it's all one word. Is that correct, Anne? Crush the Right. Pain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely check that out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other thoughts or questions as we wrap up here? And I'm going to keep an eye on our Facebook live feed to make sure there's no questions coming in there. Um, well, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, just for, for the work you're doing, but also for um, enlightening us today uh, with this, this topic. I, uh, on, on a personal level, I'm very thankful for it. I'm, I'm going in tomorrow for surgery. I'd, uh, I have this, this funky little thing over here that I've, I've got to get rid of. It's a, a, a little mass that, that's on the, in my salivary gland under my jaw. And so um, I'm getting that removed and then going through some uh, cancer treatment for the coming months uh, to get that taken care of. So. Um, I've, I've dipped my toe a bit in the water of, of chronic issues and illness. It's not painful by any means. I don't, I don't even know it's there unless I'm looking in a mirror. Um, and so uh, I've, I've been fortunate in that respect. But um, just in observing other people who go through things like, uh, we, we've got a very good friend, in fact, who right now is going through uh, a really difficult cancer diagnosis uh, that's wrapped around mm -hmm. his spine and is very painful. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's... Um, it's, it's something that I think flies so under the radar for those of us who don't experience chronic pain because people are driven into, uh, or, or I guess people are driven out of kind of our, our mainstream areas of society and culture to the point where we're just not even aware of it, that it exists. But for so many people, it's all consuming. And, yeah. uh, and this work that you're doing is so wonderful for them. Thank you, and Corey. It was really so nice talking to you and being able to um, try to have to put it together and and verbalize. Um, it was a really good practice, and I appreciate you and and the work that you guys are doing. And and thank you. I'm so glad we discovered each other. Yes, I am as well. Um, and so I I very much encourage everyone to go check out uh, Crush the Pain um, and follow Anne and the work that she's doing. Support her in any way that you can. And uh, we'll, we'll just continue to, to watch and, and support all the things that you're doing. Great, thank you. And, and I as well with you guys, thank you. All right. all right, thanks so much for being here, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording.